Hey, welcome to KUAM's Decision 2014. Uh, I'm Jess Luan, your host uh, with the candidate uh, on the buzz. Of course, I want to introduce my producer, Keen Conception, JC. Main studio guest this morning, our former senator, uh, Democrat senator, Hope Cristobal. Good morning. Banana Sizuz. Banana Sizuz. And newcomer Republican candidate, Mary Torres. Good morning, Mary. Good morning. Happy day, Jess. Banana Sizuz. Banana Sizuz. Banana Sizuz. Hey. This show, of course, is being uh, recorded for a later broadcast. It'll be broadcast tonight on local channel 2. That's at 7.30. You'll see a highlight of this show as well on KOM Headline News with Sabrina Salas Matanani and Jason Salas. And also tomorrow afternoon on KOM TV 8 at 2 p.m. Of course, uh, this afternoon's uh, show uh, re-broadcast uh, uh, will be with uh, Senator, uh, former Senator Judy Guthert and uh, Adonis Mandiola. So this show tomorrow afternoon will be at, at 2 o'clock. Good morning. And how are you ladies doing this morning? Very happy this morning. <laughs> I'm happy that I have Mary here with me uh, as well. There, there, there we go. I tell you what, did we decide who's going to go first between the two of you? Oh, Mary will okay, go Mary, first. Okay, Mary. Okay. I tell you what, you have one minute. We're going to ask you basically just state uh, who you are, or where you come from, and your platform. you got one minute, and then we'll give it to, uh, to former Senator Hope Okay. Okay. Okay, Mary. Call for the day. My name is Mary Camacho Torres. Uh, I was born and raised in the village of Tamuni. I've been living in Santa Rita for nearly 20 years. Uh, I am a family woman. I've been married to Robert Torres for 35 years. Together we have three children and uh, seven grandchildren. And throughout my, uh, my adult life, I've worked in both the private sector and I worked with the government of Guam as well. Um, did office management uh, with a law firm for 15 years. And uh, with the government, I, I headed three agencies of the government of Guam. Uh, I was deputy de general manager of the Visitors Bureau. I was the executive manager of the Airport Authority and uh, also the general manager of the Port Authority of Guam. Uh, incidentally, I was the first woman to ever head uh, both the seaport and the airport agencies. But I've also done a lot of work um, in the community, uh, serving on many government boards and community organizations. Uh, my platform is, is three-pronged. Uh, I first offer, first and foremost, principled leadership. Leadership rooted in honesty, integrity, uh, proven record of fairness, and a vision for all people. My second platform point is uh, to work on the uh, quality of life for generations to come, uh, ensuring that the decisions we make are sound and and that, uh, that we look at the systemic issues from the inside out and, and deal with them there. And my third point, platform point, is to work on self, self, greater self-governance for our island because I believe that the, uh, the will of the people and the highest law of the land should reflect uh, our island's uh, laws and not be a law dictated from a federal agency. So I would work towards uh, replacing the Organic Act of Guam with our own Guam Constitution. There you go. Um, Sandra, we have uh, a minute 30. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, Jesse. Sidus Masi, Naanu, si Hope Alvarez Cristobal. I've been a uh, teacher, an educator. Uh, I'm a retired uh, school administrator. I was a senator for one term uh, many years ago. Um, I am married to uh, Andy, who's an architect, and uh, we've been married for 45 years this year on August 30. Uh, we have five children, and we, of course, have five grandchildren. Uh, I come from the family in Alabado, uh, who helps. Um, most of my family members are up in Otdud and Sinahanya. Um, I am um, a uh, grandchild of my grandfather, who is part Filipino. My father's, my husband's uh, grandfather is also Filipino from Manila, the Cristobal family. Um, we have quite a large number in our family. Uh, we have uh, uh, people who are uh, employed in all sectors of our society. So my family members bring a lot of experience um, in both uh, the private sector as well as uh, in government offices. I am currently a culinary herb farmer. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, promoting agriculture. I would like to see um, perhaps uh, an agriculture summit, um, convince my colleague once I get in there, one mm -hmm. of my platforms. Um, I stand by my leadership for dignity, purpose, and vision. Of course, I am the primary author of our Commission on Decolonization. 
I would like to see uh, Guam uh, vote for uh, one of the political statuses that are offered to us uh, through um, Congress as well as uh, the you. UN. Th thank you, uh, um, uh, uh, Senator, with, uh, for that uh, opening, those opening remarks. Let me ask you something that's dear to, to myself and as well, they're both your plat uh, campaign platforms as, as well, and we'll, we'll start with you, of course, uh, um, um, Hope. Uh, in this situation here, you, you had just mentioned you would like to see a plebiscite vote. Yes. For and you, of course, had a lot to do with uh, the Commission on Colonization. For what you know, for how much we know, for the education that we have in the three different statuses, whether it's the independence, uh, free association, and, and statehood, if the general election were to include the plebiscite vote this year, mm -hmm. what would you vote for, and and why? Is that I know it's something dear more to self governance about yeah. you. So you know, please. my my own personal choice is really irrelevant. What as an educator, I like to teach the ideal uh, for our people, and I would like to just make sure that our people exercise their democracy rights uh, to determine our political status. And I would like to have see an education that is equal across the board for all three statuses. I believe that the status would provide us the kind of foundation that we need before we begin to write our constitution. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Mary, uh, as well, you mentioned about constitution and, and more self-governance. Your thoughts? My thoughts are right now, that before we even go into the issue of what political status we want, we need to shore up and and strengthen our current political status. I think as an unincorporated territory of the United States, we really have very little leverage. Uh, and first and foremost, I believe it's important to work on, on uh, our political status insofar as being an incorporated tori territory, an unincorporated tori territory versus an incorporated mm -hmm. territory. Because right now we really are just an insular area and we're governed by uh, a federal law, the Organic Act of Guam, and a lot of, of the uh, the, the will of the people is not truly represented. The federal government can take away and give us at its whim. And so I believe before we even go into the idea of choosing a status, we first must uh, strengthen our political status. And I believe that, that one of the first tests of, of uh, showing political maturity is adopting our own constitution, because then we've got our own state law by which we can govern ourselves and, uh, and change as we wish, as opposed to the Organic Act where in order to change the Organic Act, it requires a congressional act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and that actually, from what, what I'm hearing from both of you, Ernie, there, there's 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 a, a sen senator here that says we need a political status change, then a constitution. Where you're saying you want a constitution before we decide on our, our, our political status change, right? I okay. believe I believe okay. they're two separate issues, and they can be dealt with uh, interdependent of each other. Okay. Now let me let me start with you again. Uh, <laughs> that that being said, we we can move on. Um, it's harder because we are not, we don't determine things ourselves here in Guam. We have, of course, elected leaders that we have nothing to do with in regards to their elections that make decisions for us whether they know about Guam or not. You had managed both the uh, airport and the port authorities of, of Guam. You know, again, the, the, the challenges bestowed upon us because of the Jones Act. What are your thoughts, again, should you be elected to the 33rd Guam Legislature, how would you go about, in your capacity, to be able to convince our delegate, whoever that person may be, to move for the exemption, full exemption, of the Jones Act, which you know all too, too, too much about? Mary. <laughs> there are movements, and there have been many, many movements by the other areas, by Honolulu, by Alaska, by Puerto Rico, uh, on the full waiver to get rid of cabotage. The all indications are from, from many of the readings that uh, I've run across is that lifting the, the cabotage will have an economic uh, benefit to whatever areas are affected. For, uh, for Guam, because of our position in Guam, we have a non-voting delegate. I think that the, the real challenge for us is to to piggyback and uh, join forces with those agencies, with those with those states that have uh, bigger muscle and more political pull in the Congress and the Senate, and I, I certainly think that it's uh, an issue that is not going to go away. And the case for for um, for cabotage laws being uh, lifted 
are definitely going to get stronger as the economies are looking to strengthen themselves uh, in Hawaii, in Alaska, uh, in Puerto Rico, and especially Guam. So we, we, we just need to, to forge uh, our relations and alliances with those other brothers in the areas that have similar uh, challenges as Guam. Okay. Senator? Yeah, well, you know, um, it's been proven over time that we have done everything that we can with the kind of status that we have, which is really a non-status. You know, an unincorporated territorial status is a non-status. It is not a status that is uh, recognized by international law. And so international law uh, prevails here. And I think that uh, if we have equal footing with people who are, we, who are negotiating with us, then we would have better leverage. If we come from a uh, point of a vantage point where we're always trying to reach out and trying to, uh, trying to get there, we have tried to change. There has been many discussions on the Jones Act in the past, mm -hmm. but none have uh, stuck. And so long as Don Young is still in Congress, uh, we will ha continue to have the Jones Act. And so as elected officials, I feel that we must stand up for our constituency here. Mm -hmm. And our counterparts are those in Congress. Mm -hmm. Our counterparts are not the brass mm -hmm. that walk around Guam, you know, with their uniform and make commands of us. We will be elected officials and we must stand up for our people. We must go to Congress and demand uh, answers to our lack of status. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask, I'm going to start with you, uh, Senator. Um, the, the situation with our compact impact reimbursement. Um, both previous administration, the um, uh, Camacho Moylan, the Camacho Cruz administration, as well as this administration have been greatly challenged in the compensation. The, the, the compensation, the compact impact. I mean, we have done all that they've asked in regards to giving them basically the receipts <laughs> on, on what is owed to us, only to come back and say, well, that's not the right way to do it. Well, what is the right way to do it? And they don't have an answer on how to do it and how to do it right. How do we go about, which again, we have nothing to do in regards to the agreement, but we are left and uh, uh, when, when states, because they are states, say, hey, well, we are footing the bill for this compact impact. So their share is taken out of our coffers at this point. How, what would you do to be elected to make sure that we are compensated as the agreement has been made for? Well, again, because of our lack of status and the lack of standing in the political arena, especially here in the region, uh, I, I would like to begin by looking at those areas where we have uh, cooperative agreements at the very basic level. We have, um, we see a lot of agreements and cooperation uh, through agriculture. Say, for example, mm -hmm. Panape used to import bananas here, and for some reason we're having a problem with that. And so I would like to see first establish some regional cooperation, maybe look at some regulatory cooperation. Uh, at the basic level with these governments, with the freely associated states, uh, and try to um, um, sort of build a good relationship with the freely associated states, all those three entities, the FSM, Belau, and the Marshalls. Then, once you have that established, then you have good ground to go and say, look, we can work together, and we have these historical information that we can use. And so I think one way is to prove ourselves that we can get along, we can have regional partnerships, uh, perhaps uh, improve our economy that way too, uh, and then um, look at the 15 million that we get from Compact, uh, you know, agreements from the U.S. There you go. Um, Mary, you got a minute 20. What we have to also take into consideration is that We've got the, the compact of free association coming to an end in the next few years, and the impact at, of the, uh, the migrants that might come as a result of the, uh, the compact monies uh, being st um, seized on their end mm -hmm. will have a, a big effect on Guam. There are two things, too, going on right now. We've got to, we've got to understand that uh, it's been several years, many years, a couple decades since the compact of free associations. So many of the, the Micronesians that are on Guam are in fact U.S. citizens and residents of Guam. 
So the equation that we're looking at, who in fact are, are under the compact impact and who are, are bona fide U.S. citizens and residents of Guam, uh, we need to, de to determine that so that, the, uh, so that the true numbers and reporting aren't skewed. And, you know, there, there is, there is a, a, an argument to be made that if, if, if the U.S. government is telling us that we're not uh, reporting accurately, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we've exhausted all remedies. Uh, because because you have to to remember that over time, you know, really there are there are people who are who are productive citizens of Guam mm -hmm. of Micronesian descent that don't fall into that category. And in order to reconcile that, we have to invest in the resources mm -hmm. to truly uh, understand what those numbers are. Okay, thank you. Now, Mary, I'll start with you. Now is this first day in thirty third Guam legislature? You're definitely both of you should you be elected are going to be faced with the situation of the hospital at this point. Administrator Verga had just come back from, from the Philippines um, looking like he's going to partner up and the agreement to partner up is it looks very promising with St. Luke's to, to bring the expertise here in Guam. That's all nice, it's, it's great. But when you have that, we're incurring more cost. We have not identified, again, how we're going to pay for that additional cost because non-payers will continue to go and be non-payers. The payers are going to be the ones who will foot the bill for this. What is your remedy? Are you willing to sit down and put everything on the table, including privatization, including Gov Guam getting out of the hospital business? One of my, our first actions of the 27th Guam legislature was really looking at the feasibility of the survival of GTA as a government entity. We privatized that and now we got competitive rates, we have competitive features and things like that. It's good for Guam, good for business as well. Your thoughts? Clearly you have to look at all, all remedies and you have to understand what your options are before you can decide that you will go with privatization mm -hmm. versus a, a government hospital. I think that the, the key though that we have to always keep in mind is we have a population that is uh, that is underinsured or non-insured and that rely on this this uh, hospital for adequate health care. Uh, first and foremost we have to ensure that, that uh, the hospital can exhaust all its remedies to ensure that it has proper billing practices, that it captures all the, uh, the uh, reimbursements from the insurance companies, from Medicaid, and from those uh, customers that, that are able to pay um, for the hospital fees. Mm -hmm. We also have to have adequate resources so that we ensure that the, the level of uh, care is sufficiently met by the hospital for the people. Um, clearly, uh, you do want to ensure that you have a facility, whether it's privatized or government-owned, that can meet the demands of the health care needs of our population, whether they be insured people with the wherewithal to afford adequate health care or uh, indigent people. And what I worry about is with a, with a private hospital coming on board, the new uh, medical center, we may have a situation where those rate paying customers, uh, those that can afford, will migrate towards that. And it's, it's going to leave our Guam Memorial Hospital in a very uh, dire predicament when they're faced with uh, servicing non-paying and indigent clients uh, predominantly. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator, minute just 30. Uh, oh, just quickly, uh, I think, you know, that uh, our hospital must uh, continue to provide the services to our indigent uh, population. I think that uh, my, my stance would be that the government of Guam really has a responsibility uh, to maintain this hospital. Um, we now have a private hospital and we have had before a private hospital exists with our current uh, Guam Memorial Hospital. As a matter of fact, that hospital now occupies the former private hospital, the MCM. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the Mariana Islands and uh, I I feel that uh, we need to do everything that we can on day one uh, primary health care uh, for our people is very important and we need to uh, sit mm -hmm. down that is the major issue on island today as you know um, we have many many health issues on island our people are dying from cancers Jesse mm -hmm. is the number two killer on Guam public health has done all kinds of studies uh, we have seen uh, high, high incidence, maybe over, you know, 87% uh, 
of our island. I mean, uh, we have an 87% rate just on, mm -hmm. on one particular cancer, which is nasal pharyngeal and it afflicts mostly males. Uh, as compared to the standard population in the U.S. So I feel that there's a lot of health care to be had. I feel that the government must take primary mm -hmm. um, uh, responsibility. Okay. Well, well th thank you for that. You know, I, it's funny you should mention that because I had the opportunity to work both in the old hospital and MCM at the time. Yes, yes. You know, and the unfortunate thing, the, the private hospital at the time did not survive because of the government hospital. And here we are at different time. Uh, and we're saying we don't know if the, the government hospital is going to survive because of the private hospital. So just the reverse of, of, of then versus now. Yeah, yeah it's quite now, different. Yeah. Now, now, let me ask, so start with you, uh, Sandra. Is, is this uh, situation now, I mean, power and water, power and water. We've already seen, I mean, we have news story after news story about uh, coverages of families converting to solar power, going from hundreds of dollars a month to double digits, 10, 11, 20 dollars a month, none of that, are constantly relying on fossil fuel. I know we're moving away to, to try to get to, to gas. Again, we've done everything we can possibly, I mean, we, your cells probably include this, you, you probably take cold showers nowadays as well because, you, <laughs> you know, you, you want to save power. Maybe I'm only speaking for myself. But we've done everything that is asked of us, and of course, when we see the billing, what else can I do? As a result of our saving, our power bill comes out, we, lose, we use less, yet we pay even more, or the same as we used to years back. What are your thoughts? Because at, at some point, again, as, as we save, as uh, department agencies, uh, uh, DOE is looking into pulling solar panels in four of the schools, GPA, the GPA has, has come out and said, oh, well, hold it, slow your roll, because <coughs> we're going to lose revenue. But operational expenses have been, have, have been happened in GPA. What is your remedy to this? Because at some point, it's be <coughs> going to become a very luxurious item, if not already. Uh, yeah, you and I and Mary here can talk about water and power uh, in a way that we're only concerned about its cost. There are still many people on Guam that do not have water and power. Uh, I, I know for sure that the farmers in the northern part of Guam completely stop farming during the dry season because there's no water. Uh, and I know that many farmers are now looking at their bills and they are saying, excuse me, I'm paying more to irrigate my farm than I am uh, for the water that I get at the house. So even agricultural rates. Um, uh, are a problem. We tried to find out how this formulation came about and we can't even get to the bottom of that. We checked with legal counsel uh, at the Guam Water Authority. How do you figure this out? We have not yet got to that point. And so, um, yes, Jesse, it is a serious issue. Our cost of living on Guam is very high. Uh, we are not a sustainable island, and we once were. You know, after World War II, we were able to feed everybody on this island. We provided all the fruits and vegetables. Uh, I mean, you know, it may be digressing, but gosh, we were thriving at one time, mm -hmm. and we were self-sustaining. Where is that today? And so we need to work on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mary, please, you have a minute 15. When the cost of a power bill equals the cost of your mortgage, I think something is very wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, what I believe needs to happen is, you know, a lot of my, my platform issues is forward vision, looking mm -hmm. at the broad picture. What policies are we, we going to make today that are going to greatly affect and impact for generations to come? I think with regard to uh, electricity needs, what we need to do is come up with a master plan uh, specific to renewable energy. And what we're going to do to have uh, a program to put a renewal, renewable energy in place for the island in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, this idea of imported fossil fuels, uh, I think, is, is a, a, time, a, a thing of the past. We need mm -hmm. to move beyond that. Um, any other remedy that, that requires the, uh, the import of, of the, the raw product is going to be cost uh, prohibitive for our island, I believe, going forward. So we have to look at renewable energy. Mm -hmm. You know, last night, uh, thank you, and, and yeah. last night I, I had um, 
former speaker Joe T. Sanoxino on my show, and we talked about war reparations. And the sad comment he made, and I had to look at myself and do it, and I said, the sad comment that he made was, nobody really is interested in war reparations anymore. I mean, there are very few of us, basically, he said. There's about a thousand of us. So it does not have a constituency anymore. We're in our 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, the, as of late, Section 30s monies were, were looked at to, as a compact impact reimbursement. That's, that, was, that was turned down. What is your view? What would you propose? Uh, it was mentioned in, in a publication as an opinion by, by a journalist that said, hey, look, we should stop pursuing it. Forget it. I mean, we should be very happy with the, the, the grants that we're getting and all these, these federal monies that are coming in here. You know, you're, we're really ungrateful at this point. So do you believe, I, I mean, do you have that same, same uh, thought in mind as well? And, and if not, what, do, what are your remedies to try to get closure in, in, in this whole scenario? For me, yeah. Jesse, I think that we started out on the wrong foot anyway on the war reparations. I have always been of the mind that the whole island hurt. The hurt of World War II was not on just each individual person's here. And to continue to feed that kind of idea that, oh, each one of us is entitled to a certain amount of money because uh, a war was fought on our land. I say we had a hurt that was a hurt across the island. And if there's any remuneration or any reparation to be made, I think it should be made to the government of Guam. I think it should be made to the whole island. I think that uh, that's where we can say, all right, build us the hospital. All right, these are the hurts that occurred to us. Homes were demolished. I mean, you know, people's lives were devastated. And granted, yes, many people individually got hurt. But it was a hurt that was felt throughout the whole island. Our whole landscape was changed. We need to bring back agricultural lands, for example. We don't have. We need to have a master plan just for, the, for agriculture. We've been bulldozing all kinds of areas to build you know, homes. What are we setting aside to be more sustainable you know, today? Mm -hmm. Mary, please, yeah, minute 10. We don't want to lose sight of, of, of the significance of the Chamorro people, what they endured. Um, I, what I would like to do is, I believe the issue needs to stay on the table, mm -hmm. but I think the focus would not be not so much on, on getting a monetary award as we ensure that the stories of Guam and the significance of Guam in the World War II arena, the significance of the, of, of the fact that we were the only occupied U.S. possession uh, in World War II needs to be told because I think that we have our rightful place in, in the history books uh, across this nation and I think that, that that would be the greatest homage to our people if their stories are perpetuated in the historic books so that people understand the plight of the Chamorro people during World War II, the significance of their sacrifice, and the significance of freedom to us as, as you can see uh, played in our patriotism today. But that story of the people, I think, will carry further in the annals of history and have uh, and, and show greater respect for their memory and for their trials if we could uh, encapsulate it in the history book. So I would push to, to be recognized uh, in that official in, for our role officially yeah. in the historic okay. books. Well, thank you very much. Hey, we'll come to that time. You know, we've got a minute left uh, again. Uh, right. Please tell the folks again who you are, what number you are, what side of the ballot you're in, and what will be the first thing you do should you be elected in the third third one legislature. Oh gosh, um, I'm Hope Cristobal. I'm number five on the Democratic side. It's on the left side of the ballot. Uh, I would like one of the first things that I would like is to. Uh, ensure that the 40, over 40 contaminated sites in our island are cleaned uh, because of our high rates of cancer. I, and I think that I, we could do that without cost to our local government. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're number one again? I'm number five number from five. the Democratic there we go. side. Okay, Mary, please. I'm Mary Camacho Torres. I'm number 11 uh, candidate on the Republican, with the Republican Party of Guam. Uh, I would like to work on the, on the um, on the big picture items, you know, I come from, I have a very unique background being the, the daughter of a governor, the sister of a governor, uh, the wife of a chief justice, and I have seen so much of the contemporary issues in, in uh, a very practical way. I don't take anything for granted, and uh, I believe that we have to earn the respect and confidence of our people. What I would like to do, first and foremost, is work on the children. Look at, at, uh, at uh, laws that deal with 
with juvenile, uh, the juvenile justice system and, you know, specifically how can we make it better for those children who are at dual risk, who come from families uh, with parents that are also in trouble with the law. Because I think the future of our island depends on fixing things from the inside out. And I would start first and foremost with the youth and then progress uh, forward from there. Well, thank you very much again for being with us this morning. I want to say congratulations also to the Chief Justice as being elected. Much. And he's the man. He's the main man. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's that's great news for Guam. It's, just it's good, great news for him. So again, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, you coming in here, and give us your your time. And I'm sure we'll see you again in the general election. As uh, of course our, our news team will will set up up for you. And you can view this uh, tonight, of course, uh, seven thirty on local channel two, as well as you'll be at. Um, uh, some highlights on KOM Headline News with Sabrina Sasmatanani and Jason Salas. And also tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. on KOM TV8, you can see this rebroadcast of these two ladies here. It's uh, goodbye for now. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning when my in-studio guest will be incumbent Senator Tina Rose Munya Barnes as well as former Senator Jimmy Espaldon. That's tomorrow morning right here in Isla 63. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye.